Chapter 1 Recall to Life The Dover Mail was struggling up Shooter's Hill one November night in 1775. The road was dark and muddy, and the passengers were all walking beside the coach to make the work of the horses easier. There were three passengers, all wearing heavy coats and boots. They trudged wearily up the hill through the heavy mist, not speaking to each other. There was a great fear of highwaymen in those days, and the guard and driver of the Dover Mail were anxious. They watched the passengers suspiciously. Just as the coach reached the top of the hill, the driver heard a noise in the darkness ahead. He listened intently for a moment. Then he was sure. There was a horse approaching at a gallop. The guard had heard the noise as well, and he drew out his blunderbuss. The passengers had also heard the horse, and they stood in silence near the coach. The sound of the horse was very clear, and the guard called out loudly, Stop! Stop, or I'll fire! The rider stopped his horse very quickly. <laughs> the passengers peered uneasily through the mist, but they could not see the rider or his horse. Is that the Dover Mail? The man on the horse called out. The guard aimed his weapon carefully. Why do you want to know? He replied loudly. I want a passenger, the voice replied. I'm looking for Mr Jarvis Lorry. One of the passengers stepped forward when he heard his name and spoke quickly to the guard. The guard looked suspiciously at Mr Lorry for a moment. Then he called out to the rider again. Come closer to the coach, he ordered. But come very slowly. If you move quickly, I'll fire. The man on the horse moved out of the darkness and approached the coach. It's all right, guard, said Mr Lorry quietly. I work for Telson's Bank in London, and this man is one of our messengers. The messenger passed a piece of paper to Mr Lorry, who opened it hurriedly and read the message in the light of the coach lamp. Wait at Dover for Mademoiselle. Mr Lorry turned to the man on the horse. Jerry, he ordered, take this answer back. Recalled to life. They'll know what you mean. That's all. You can go now. Mr Lorry stepped into the coach and the driver flicked his whip at the horses. The coach moved slowly forward towards Dover. Recalled to life. That's the strangest message I've ever heard. The man called Jerry said to himself. He paused for a moment or two, watching the coach disappear in the darkness and mist. Then he shrugged his shoulders and began the long ride back to London. By morning, the mail had arrived in Dover, stopping outside a hotel. Two of the passengers had got out previously at their destinations. Mr Lorry, the remaining passenger, climbed stiffly down to the ground. He walked into the hotel and ordered breakfast. He was cold and hungry, and he had not slept much during the long journey from London. He had been thinking a lot about the past, and his memories were painful ones. He sat by the fire and made himself comfortable. Mr Lorry ate his breakfast hungrily and then went outside for a walk. The coast of France could just be seen from the seafront at Dover. Mr Lorry peered anxiously towards it, and his face grew serious. He plunged into thought once more. That afternoon, Mr Lorry settled himself in the hotel. He ordered an early dinner and had just finished eating when he heard the sound of a carriage outside.
That'll be Mademoiselle, he said to himself nervously. A few minutes later, the waiter came in to tell him that Miss Manette had arrived from London and that she wanted to see the gentleman from Telson's bank. Mr. Lorry sighed deeply. He stood up and followed the waiter to Miss Manette's room in the hotel. He seemed a little afraid of meeting the young lady. When he entered the room, he saw a young girl of about seventeen standing near a table. The girl was slender, and she had golden hair. Mr. Lorry stared at her for a moment. He remembered an occasion many years before when he had carried a small child in his arms on the boat from France. Miss Manette smiled at him. Please sit down, sir, she said politely. Mr. Lorry sat down and waited for her to speak again. I had a message from Telson's bank yesterday, Miss Manette went on. There is apparently some very surprising news about my father's property, which the bank said you would tell me about. The bank also told me I would have to travel to Paris to see about it. Mr. Lorry nodded his head. For a moment there was silence, and then he coughed awkwardly. Ahem. <clears throat> I am a man of business, Miss Manette. What I have to tell you is a matter of business. I want to tell you the story of one of our customers. Mr. Lorry coughed again and then went on. <clears throat> this particular customer was a French gentleman, a doctor, as it happens. Did he live in Beauvais? Miss Manette asked eagerly. Yes, he did. He lived in Beauvais, just like your father. I knew him, you see. I lived in Paris in those days, and I worked in the Paris branch of Telson's. When did all this happen? Miss Manette asked quickly. About twenty years ago, Mr. Lorry replied. The gentleman married an English lady, and Telson's bank managed their financial affairs. It was a business relationship, you see. Just a business relationship, you understand. This is my father's story, cried Miss Manette excitedly. She looked at Mr. Lorry keenly, as if trying to remember a face from the past. Was it you who brought me to England after my parents died? Was it you, sir? Mr. Lorry bowed to her politely. It was me, he admitted. It was an affair of business, you see. Just business. That's all. As you have guessed, I am telling you the story of your father. You know that your father died, Miss Manette. He coughed awkwardly again, as if he did not know how to go on with his story. Ahem. <clears throat> But the man in my story did not die. Miss Manette went very pale. She began to tremble violently. Please be calm, my dear, the banker said softly. He spoke gently now, and he studied the young girl's face as he continued with his story. What if Monsieur Manette had not died? What if he had been taken away to a dreadful place? What if he had had a powerful enemy who put him in prison? What if His friends did not know what had happened to him. Although Miss Manette was even paler now, she was listening to every word that the banker was saying. Go on, sir, she said. Tell me everything, but tell me quickly. Your father has been found, my dear. He is alive. He's been taken to the house of his old servant in Paris. That's why you and I are going to Paris. Miss Manette began to tremble even more than before. It won't be my father, she cried in distress. It will be his ghost. It's my father's ghost you're taking me to see, Mr. Lorry. It's his ghost. Mr. Lorry tried to calm the young girl. Nonsense, my dear, he said softly. You're going to see your own father. The poor gentleman has suffered very badly, but you will bring him back to life. 
Then he raised a hand in warning. We don't know what happened in the past, he told her, and we mustn't ask. France is a dangerous country, and our business is a secret one. I am carrying no papers with me at all. Our mission is a simple one, Miss Manette. Recalled to life describes it perfectly. Miss Manette looked at Mr. Lorry. Her eyes were wide open and she was very pale. She did not say a word. She sat in perfect silence for a few minutes and Mr. Lorry realised that she was in some kind of a faint. He shouted loudly for help. Ho oh there! Help! Ho oh there! A large red-haired woman rushed into the room after Mr. Lorry's call for help. She ran over to Miss Manette and seized her hand. Then she began to shout angrily at the hotel servants who had come into the room with her. Why don't you do something? she yelled. Go and get some smelling salts and some cold water. Don't just sit there looking at the poor girl. The servants ran out of the room to fetch the things that were needed. The angry, red-haired woman bent tenderly over Miss Manette, stroking her face and whispering softly to her. Then she turned to Mr. Lorry in fury. What have you done to her? she asked angrily. Couldn't you give her your news without frightening her to death? Mr. Lorry watched as the woman continued stroking Miss Manette's face and talking softly to her. After a few minutes, the girl recovered consciousness. I hope she will be all right now, Mr. Lorry said quietly. No thanks to you, the woman said fiercely. Chapter 2 Paris The streets in the Saint-Antoine district of Paris were dirty and mean. The people who lived there were poor, and most of them were thin and ill-fed. A man was unloading a large barrel of wine from a cart in the street when there was an accident. The barrel slipped out of the cart and broke in the street. <laughs> and a dark river of wine ran along the ground. <laughs> Stopping what they were doing, everyone ran to the spot where the accident had taken place. Men, women and children began scooping up the dirty wine and drinking it from their hands. There was laughter from the crowd as they scooped up the wine and there were smiles on the starved faces of the people. Soon, everyone's mouth and hands were stained red with the wine. One man dipped his finger in the wine and scrawled a dismal word on the wall. Blood. Nearby, there was a small wine shop, and the owner was watching the scene in the street. He was a man of about thirty. He frowned when he saw the joker write the word blood on the wall. The wine shopkeeper's wife, Madame Defarge, was also watching the scene in the street. She, too, frowned, but she said nothing. She had some knitting in her hands, and her fingers worked continuously with the needles. Monsieur Defarge turned back into the shop after a few minutes. He was surprised that two customers had entered the shop unseen by him. One of them was a middle-aged gentleman, and the other was a young girl. They were not the kind of people who would usually enter a wine shop in the Saint-Antoine district. The gentleman said something quietly to Defarge. The wine shopkeeper was surprised for a moment and then he signalled to the two customers to follow him out of the shop. Mr. Lorry and Miss Manette rose quickly from the table and followed Defarge. He led them through a little courtyard into another house. All three of them climbed the narrow staircase up to the top of the house. Defarge stopped outside a door and listened intently. He took a key out of his pocket. He's locked in, exclaimed Mr. Lorry in surprise. Why do you keep him locked in? He has been a prisoner for many years, Monsieur Defarge replied grimly. And he would be frightened of freedom. 
That's why I always turn the key in the door when I go in. Although Lucy Manette had not managed to hear any of the whispered conversation between the two men, she looked worried and frightened. Defarge pushed the door open softly, and they all entered the tiny, ill-lit room. There was an old man sitting with his back to the door. He was very busy making shoes. Defarge made a slight noise. <coughs> And the old man turned to face him. He had long white hair, and an untidy beard, and he was very thin. The old man saw Miss Manette and Mister Lorry, but he showed no interest in them. Show the gentleman the shoes you are making. Defarge commanded. Mister Lorry stepped forward and leaned over the old man's work. Then he spoke quietly to him. Doctor Manette, don't you remember him? He pointed at Defarge. Don't you remember your servant from long ago? Take a good look at him. The old man was startled and dropped the shoe he was holding in his hand. He frowned for a moment, and it seemed as if he was struggling to remember something from the past. The effort was too great for him, however, and after a few seconds, his face went blank. He reached down, picked up the shoe that had fallen, and resumed his work. Do you recognize him, sir? Defarge asked the Englishman. It's him, Mister Lorry replied. He's greatly changed, but it is him. Miss Manette moved quietly to the old man's side and stood beside him. She was still very pale, but there was an expression of great tenderness on her face now. The old man raised his eyes and looked at her. He seemed afraid of her. What does this mean? He asked fearfully. Who are you? He took hold of her long golden hair, and stroked it with his fingers. Then he began muttering to himself. It's the same, but it's impossible. So much time has gone by. It's impossible. He peered anxiously into her face. You can't be, he said softly. You look like her, and your hair is the same, but it's impossible. She would be old now, like me. Miss Manette put her arm around the old man and spoke softly to him. I am your daughter, she told him gently, and I have come to take you home. We are going to England. Chapter Three. The Old Bailey. Five years passed. Doctor Manette and his daughter Lucy settled in a small house in London with Lucy's old nurse, Miss Pross. The doctor returned to health and began to see patients once more. Sometimes, however, memories of his suffering came back to him, and for a couple of days or more he would take up his shoemaking again. It was impossible to talk to him, and he lost all idea of where he was. He imagined himself to be back in prison, and he withdrew completely into silence and suffering. Mister Lorry visited them frequently when he had time off from his duties at Telson's Bank, where Jerry Cruncher was still working as a messenger. One day. The clerk told Jerry to go straight away to the Old Bailey to deliver a message to Mister Lorry. The Old Bailey, sir, repeated Jerry. What's going on there? And what's Mister Lorry got to do with the Old Bailey? I wonder. Mister Lorry is giving evidence in a trial. That's all. The clerk told him. Jerry hurried to the Old Bailey as quickly as he could and entered the grim old building. He pushed through the crowd of lawyers and spectators who had come to watch the trial that was taking place.
What's the trial about? He asked one of the officials. I suppose it's a forgery case. It's not forgery. The official told him. It's more serious than that. It's treason. That's quartering. Jerry said quietly. Barbarous. It's the law. The official said sternly. Jerry made his way into the court and looked around for Mr. Lorry. He saw him sitting next to an elderly gentleman and a young girl. They were talking seriously together and the young girl seemed worried and nervous. She kept looking towards the dock where the prisoner was standing. The prisoner was a well-dressed young man. He stood calmly, waiting for the trial to begin. The prosecuting counsel rose to his feet and described the charges against the prisoner. The prisoner, he explained, was called Charles Darnay. He had travelled many times between England and France, and the prosecutor said that the purpose of his journeys was to carry information that was dangerous to England. The prosecutor said that he would now bring forward his witnesses, who would prove that Charles Darnay was an enemy to England and that he deserved severe punishment. His first witness was a man called John Barsard. This witness said he had once been a friend of the prisoners, but that he had broken off the friendship when he became sure that Charles Darnay was a spy for France. The witness spoke confidently, and the prosecuting counsel was obviously pleased with the way he gave his evidence. Next, it was the defence counsel's turn to ask John Barsard some questions. Had he ever been a spy himself? No. What was the source of his income? His property. Where was this property? He didn't remember. Had he ever been in prison? Never. Had he ever been in a debtor's prison? Yes. How many times? Two or three. Not five or six? Perhaps. Had he ever been a gambler? No more than other gentlemen. Had he ever borrowed money from the prisoner? Yes. Had he paid the money back? No. John Barsard left the witness stand a little awkwardly after the defence counsel had finished with him. The prosecuting counsel called another witness, Mr Jarvis Lorry. He asked Mr Lorry to remember a night five years ago when he had been a passenger on the Dover Mail. How many other passengers were there on the mail? Two. Was the prisoner one of them? I don't know. They were both wrapped up against the comb. I could not see their faces. Have you ever seen the prisoner anywhere? Yes. He was on the boat when I returned from France a few days later. Were you travelling alone, Mr Lorry? No. I was travelling with Dr Manette and his daughter, Lucy. The prosecution counsel now called Lucy Manette to the stand. She confirmed that she had talked to the prisoner. Charles Darnay had noticed that her father was ill and had helped her to make the old man comfortable for the crossing. He had been polite and kind to both herself and her father. She hoped that her evidence would not get him into trouble. The prosecution counsel now called a final witness to prove that Charles Darnay had got out of the Dover Mail in the middle of the night and had then walked some twelve miles through the darkness to a garrison town where he had waited for an accomplice. The prisoner's two defence counsels listened to this witness very carefully. The junior counsel, who had not played a very active part throughout the trial, yawned and stretched in his chair as if the whole trial was a bore and a waste of time. Then he wrote a hurried note and passed it along to his colleague. His colleague read the note with surprise, then rose to his feet to ask the witness some questions. Are you quite sure that the man you saw in the garrison town was the prisoner Charles Darnay? Quite sure. Have you ever seen anyone else who looked like the prisoner? No. Look at my young colleague for a moment. 
the defence counsel told the witness. Now look at the prisoner again. Do they not look like each other? The witness looked at the young barrister. Then he looked again at the prisoner. It was true. The two men were similar. Can you still say that the man you saw in the garrison town was the prisoner? Asked the defence counsel. The witness could not swear it. It was possible he had made a mistake. All the evidence had now been heard, and the jury retired to consider their verdict on the prisoner. Everyone stood up and began to walk about the court, talking to friends and colleagues. The young defence counsel left his colleague for a moment and approached Mr. Lorry. Is Miss Manette all right? He asked eagerly, having seen her about to faint. She is upset, but she'll be all right. Mr. Lorry told him. You have given the prisoner a good defence, Mr. Carton. He said politely. Sidney Carton smiled grimly. Then he walked up to the prisoner. Miss Manette will be all right, he said coldly. I'm deeply sorry to have been the cause of her suffering, Charles Darnay said. Time moved slowly while the jury was considering the fate of the prisoner. Jerry was waiting outside the court building when Mr. Lorry ran excitedly up to him, waving a piece of paper. Take this to the bank straight away, he ordered. Jerry looked at the piece of paper. There was one word written on it. Acquitted. If he had written record to life, I would have understood him this time, Jerry said to himself as he hurried towards Telson's bank. Chapter 5 A Marriage and a Confession More time passed, and Mr. Charles Darnay established himself in England as a teacher of French. He often visited Dr. Manette and Lucy, and gradually he fell in love. Mr. Lorry was a visitor to the house as well, going there on Sundays after his week's work at Telson's Bank. The young lawyer, Sidney Carton, was another visitor at Dr. Manette's house. He was a strange young man, often bitter and sharp in his conversation. He drank too much, and there was an air of sadness about him. He did not like Charles Darnay, and was frequently cold in his behaviour to the Frenchman whose life he had so brilliantly saved at the Old Bailey. Charles Darnay finally managed to approach Dr. Manette to tell him of his love for Lucy. The old man did not want to lose his daughter, but he liked Darnay and respected him. If my daughter loves you, he told the young man, I shall be happy to see you married to her. There's one other thing, Darnay added. You know that my name is not really Darnay. I'd rather you knew who I really am. No, cried Dr. Manette suddenly. For a moment he looked quite afraid. I don't wish to hear it now, my friend. But you can tell me, he went on, on the morning of the day you marry Lucy. A few days later, Sidney Carton came to the house. He looked tired and ill and appeared to be ashamed of himself. Are you all right? Lucy asked him. No, Miss Manette, he replied sadly. I lead a bad life, and I am never all right. But what can be done? You could change your way of living, perhaps, Lucy suggested with a smile. She was surprised to see tears coming to his eyes. It's too late for that, he told her. I shall go on living the way I do, and I shall sink lower and lower. I can't help it. He paused and looked embarrassed. Please forgive me for talking like this to you, he said humbly. I shall never do it again, but I have something particular that I want to say to you. Again he paused and looked at her in great distress. I have loved you from the first, he said, and the thought of you has made me try to change my life. 
But it's useless. It's too late to change. It's never too late to change, Lucy suggested softly. I shall go on living the way I do, he said. But I shall always love you. I will sink lower and lower in life, but my heart will always be turned to you. And if there is ever anything I can do for you, or for the people that you love, I would do it, no matter the cost. One evening, Dr. Manette and his daughter were sitting together in the garden. Lucy was to be married the following day. You won't feel lonely when I'm married, will you, Father? Lucy asked anxiously. I've already told you, her father replied calmly, that your marriage to Charles gives me great pleasure. He's a fine young man, my dear, and I'm happy for both of you. The old man was very thoughtful as he went up to his room that night. He had pretended to be happy. But his mind was troubled by his daughter's marriage. He was afraid of loneliness. The next morning, Charles Darnay came to the house. He had not forgotten his promise to Dr. Manette and had come to tell the old man his real name. He and the doctor went into the study together, where they remained for a few minutes. When they came out, the doctor looked pale and he was trembling. He made a great effort, however, and managed to look cheerful and happy during the wedding ceremony. Lucy and her husband left London on their honeymoon. Dr. Manette, Miss Pross, and Mr. Lorry said goodbye to them. The doctor was very quiet and thoughtful for the rest of the day, and Mr. Lorry was worried about him. I must go to Telson's Bank, Mr. Lorry told Miss Pross. But I'll come back as soon as I've finished there. It was evening before Mr. Lorry returned to the house. He entered the doctor's room and found the old man standing at a table with his back to the door. He was making shoes, just as he had been doing when Mr. Lorry found him in Paris. Mr. Lorry spoke quietly to the doctor, but he received no reply. The doctor did not recognize him. Miss Pross and Mr. Lorry watched the doctor carefully over the next few days. They did not want to ruin Lucy's honeymoon by telling her that her father was ill. They hoped he would recover before the young couple came home. The days passed slowly, and Dr. Manette spent them making shoes. On the tenth day, however, there was a change in the doctor's condition. He came downstairs in the morning in the usual way, and he talked normally to Miss Pross and Mr. Lorry. He had recovered completely, but he had no memory of the days he had spent making shoes. Chapter 6 The Revolution in France Another six years went by, and Lucy and Charles Darnay were happy together. They now had a young daughter, also called Lucy. Dr. Manette had never fallen into his illness again, and he too was cheerful and contented. Mr. Lorry continued his Sunday visits to the household and was regarded as one of the family. Sidney Carton visited the family as well, but only came five or six times a year. He took care never to drink wine on the days when he came to the house. One night, in July 1789, Mr. Lorry came to the house after he had finished work at Telson's Bank. He seemed tired. It's been a busy day, he said. Our customers in France are uneasy. Our Paris office has been full of customers, and all of them have been leaving their money and valuables for us to look after. They all want their property sent to England as soon as possible. The situation in France is serious, commented Charles Darnay. The news from there is not good. There was much excitement in the Saint Antoine district of Paris that day. Many people could be seen in the streets. Most of them were carrying weapons. 
Defarge was issuing orders to the men who stood near him. His face was determined and solemn. Keep near me, Jacques Three, he told one of the men. Then he turned to the crowd and roared, To the Bastille! There was a huge cheer from the people in the street. Hey! Hey! Swords were waved and muskets loaded. There was soon a sea of people surrounding the Bastille prison and clamoring for entry. A few soldiers leaned down from the Bastille walls to see what was happening. Orders were shouted and the crowd attacked the Bastille. There was fire and smoke everywhere and in the center stood Defarge, always directing his men to the enemy's weakest places. Forward! He cried. Madame Defarge was also there, commanding the women of Paris who took part in the battle. We can kill as well! She cried as she led the women forward. The defenders of the Bastille were soon swept away and the governor of the prison was set upon and killed by the angry crowd. Defarge led his men into the building and they liberated the prisoners. Then he made his way to the cell that had once been Dr. Manette's. He peered at the walls and the few pieces of furniture. He was looking for something. Look, Jacques! He cried excitedly. Look, there on the wall! He pointed at some initials. A... M. Alexandra Manette, he said. This was the doctor's cell, all right. He began to search the old fireplace, dislodging a cloud of dust as he did so. Something fell into the fireplace, and Defarge bent quickly to pick it up. There's nothing here, Jacques, he said. We may as well go. Mr. Lorry was constantly busy at Telson's bank because of the dramatic events in France. There was a continuous stream of customers from France in the bank's premises, and people left messages for friends and family members there. One day, Charles Darnay happened to visit Mr. Lorry in his office. Mr. Lorry was preparing to travel to France on business. Darnay tried to persuade him not to go, pointing out the dangers of such a trip while the country was undergoing a revolution. Don't try to dissuade me, the banker said with a smile. I've worked for Telson's all my life, and I feel a loyalty to the bank and to our customers. I must go. Just then, one of the bank clerks brought in a letter and handed it to Mr. Lorry. This has come for the Marquis St. Evremond, sir, the clerk explained. But no one knows where the Marquis is, or even if he's in England at all. Charles Darnay, who had inherited the title from his uncle, had kept the truth of his identity a secret from everybody except Dr. Manette. He did not want to reveal it to Mr. Lorry. As it happens... He told Mr. Lorry. I know the Marquis. I'll deliver the letter for you if you like. Mr. Lorry was happy to pass the letter to him. Later that day, Darnay opened the letter from France. He read it with trembling hands. Dear Marquis, I have always been a faithful servant to the Evremont family, and now I have been arrested and thrown into prison in Paris. They tell me I am an enemy of the people and that I must die. My crime is that I followed your orders after your uncle died. I beg you to come to France and help your old servant, Gabel. Darnay had made his decision before he finished reading this appeal for help. He knew that he had to go to France to do what he could for Gabel. He sighed deeply. He did not want to leave Lucy and Dr. Manette. But he knew that he had to go. He wrote a letter to Lucy explaining why he had to travel to Paris, and then he left for France. Chapter 7 A Prisoner of the Revolution Charles Darnay's journey through France was a difficult and dangerous one. He was stopped at every town and his papers were inspected. 
It soon became known that he was an aristocrat who was journeying to Paris to save the life of an old servant of the family, and he was treated roughly by the new revolutionary officials. When he arrived in Paris, he was immediately arrested and thrown into prison. A few days later, while Mr. Lorry was sitting in his office in Paris, there was suddenly a noise outside his office. Two people burst into the room. Lucy! he cried in astonishment. And you, Dr. Manette? What are you doing here in Paris? It's Charles! Lucy explained hurriedly. He's here in Paris, in prison. Then she explained why Darnay had come to France and how he had been arrested. It's all in the letter he left for me before he came here, she explained. We must save him, she cried desperately. Dr. Manette spoke now. His voice was strong and firm. I have great influence here, he said calmly. Everyone knows that I've been a prisoner in the Bastille. They'll listen to me, and I hope they'll let Charles go. Dr. Manette left immediately for the prison where Charles was being held. He found the situation there extremely dangerous and chaotic. A lot of prisoners had been murdered by the crowd, and a revolutionary tribunal had been set up by the authorities for trying those who had survived. This was the time when the guillotine was introduced as the preferred form of execution. Hundreds of people were executed, and the dreaded tumbrils carrying aristocrats to their death could be heard on the Paris streets every day. It was a time of fear and terror. In the days and weeks that followed, Dr. Manette worked hard to save his son-in-law. He went before the tribunal and explained who he was and how he had been held in the Bastille for 18 years without trial. Once the tribunal knew his history, he was regarded as a friend of the new authorities. They treated him with great respect, but little was done to free Lucy's husband, who was always angrily referred to as Evremond. Months went by, and Dr. Manette went to the tribunal every day to plead his case. Finally, the doctor returned to Mr. Lorry's house one night in a mood of great excitement. I think I've succeeded, he told Lucy. Charles is going to be moved to another prison tomorrow, and then his trial will take place before the tribunal. He looked tenderly at her. Don't be frightened, my dear. They'll free him, I'm sure of it. Outside in the street, they could hear the sound of wheels. They both listened, knowing what the noise meant. More tumbrils carrying people to the guillotine. I must speak to Mr. Lorry, the doctor said quickly. Mr. Lorry had been sitting in his office with a visitor from England when he heard the voices of Dr. Manette and Lucy. His visitor was Sidney Carton. The lawyer did not want to be seen by the doctor or his daughter because he wanted to keep his presence in Paris a secret for a while. He signalled to the banker to go out to the doctor and Lucy. Chapter 9 Sidney Carton Plays Cards Jerry and Miss Pross did not know that Charles Darnay had been rearrested by the court. They were walking through the streets together, planning what they should buy at the market. Miss Pross carried her shopping bag with her and looked cheerfully into the shop windows as they went along. They went into a wine shop and placed their order. As they waited, Miss Pross looked around the shop at the other customers. Suddenly, she gave a scream and clapped her hands together. Oh! Solomon! she cried rushing up to a man who was standing by himself in the shop. Solomon, my own brother! What's the matter? The man asked. Then he looked at her and went very pale. Don't call me Solomon, he whispered fiercely. Do you want to be the death of me? Brother! cried Miss Pross again. The man gave her a frightened look and hurried out of the shop. 
He made a sign to Miss Pross to follow him into the street. What do you want? He asked her coldly once they were outside the shop. How can you talk to me like that? Miss Pross exclaimed sadly. Haven't you got any feelings for me at all, Solomon? The man hastily kissed her. I'll go away, he said roughly. I'm an official here, and you're putting me in great danger. If people knew that we were brother and sister... Jerry had been silent up to now, but he had been studying the man very carefully. What's your real name? He asked the man thoughtfully. Is it John or is it Solomon? She calls you Solomon, but I knew you as John. And your second name wasn't Pross when you were in England. What do you mean? I remember you, you see, Jerry said slowly. You were a witness at an old Bailey trial. You were a government spy and you gave evidence against the prisoner. You were called John something. I remember the John part all right, but I don't remember the rest. What was it? Barsard. A voice uttered quietly. That's the name! Jerry shouted excitedly. He turned to see who had spoken and found himself facing Sidney Carton. Don't be frightened, Miss Pross, Carton said quietly. I arrived today. I'm staying at Mr Lorry's. The young lawyer looked at Miss Pross's brother with anger and contempt. I'm sorry about your brother, though. He's what they call a sheep of the prisons. The man turned even paler when he heard this accusation. He looked at Sidney Carton in great fear. Carton looked back at him quietly and then went on. I saw you coming out of the prison, you know. I remembered you very well from the treason trial at the Old Bailey, Mr. Barsard. It wasn't difficult for me to guess what you were doing here in Paris. And it gave me an idea, you see. What idea? The man asked nervously. What are you talking about? It would be difficult to discuss my idea here, among all this crowd. Carton replied with a smile. Why don't we go to Telson's Bank? We can talk quietly there. Why should I go with you? The man asked. I can't say why. Carton replied smoothly. You mean you won't say why? The man said. Sidney Carton smiled again. Precisely. You understand me very well. Sidney Carton and John Barsard, or Solomon Pross, were soon sitting in Telson's bank talking to Mr Lorry. Carton explained very quickly who the man was, and Mr Lorry remembered him from the old Bailey trial. The banker looked in disgust at Miss Pross's brother. Then Carton told Mr Lorry about Charles Darney having been arrested again. I don't know if Dr Manette will be able to save him this time, Carton said. These are desperate times, Mr. Lorry, and I think the doctor's influence with the court is on the wane. Yes, desperate times indeed, he said thoughtfully. And desperate times call for a desperate game. My game is to win a friend inside the prison. You, Mr. Barsard, he announced firmly. You'll need good cards to win that game, the spy said coldly. In a moment, I'll show you my cards, Carton said grimly. But first, if you don't mind, Mr. Lorry, some brandy. Mr. Lorry brought over a bottle of brandy and placed it in front of Sidney Carton. The lawyer quickly drank two full glasses of it and then turned back to the spy. You're an informer, he said calmly. You work for the French authorities in the prison. Your job is to listen to the prisoners and to report what they say. But you used to be a spy for the British government, didn't you? That's my first card, Mr. Barsard. Your career in London. I wonder what the French authorities would say if they knew that. Would they think you were still a spy for the British government? Would they see you as a traitor? He paused to take another glass of brandy. Now look at your cards, Mr. Barsard, he advised pleasantly. What have you got? The spy was silent for a moment. 
He was thinking hard. Everything that the lawyer had told him was true. He had indeed been a spy for the British government. He had lost that job because it was soon discovered that the evidence he gave at trials, like the trial of Charles Darney at the Old Bailey, was unreliable. He had then come to France, where he had worked for the government before the revolution. After the revolution, he had changed sides and now worked for the very people he had spied on before. He was in a dangerous position, and he knew it. You don't seem to like your cards, Carton commented wryly. Are you going to play, my friend? Miss Pross's brother sighed deeply. He realised that he was beaten. You told me you had an idea, Mr. Carton, he said wearily. I'd like to hear it. But I warn you, you can't ask too much of me. Don't ask me to do anything dangerous. Sidney Carton smiled at him. I'm not asking much, he told him. You're one of the prison jailers, aren't you? Escape is impossible, the spy hurriedly interrupted. I won't have anything to do with it. It's too dangerous. I have not said anything about an escape. The lawyer reminded him softly. But there is something you can do for me. We'll discuss it in private, if you don't mind. He stood up and went into another room, and John Bass had followed him. Sidney Carton closed the door carefully, and Mr Lorry could hear them talking earnestly in low voices. Their discussion went on for a long time. Chapter 11 Sidney Carton Plays His Last Card Fifty-two prisoners were due to die the next day, and Charles Darnay was among them. He sat alone in his cell and thought about what had happened. He was young, and it was hard for him to accept that he had to die. He called the jailer and bought paper and ink, intending to put his affairs in order before the next day. He wrote a long letter to Lucy, assuring her of his love. He explained that he had known nothing about her father's imprisonment and nothing about what his father and uncle had done to the young peasant girl and her family. He told Lucy to comfort her father for the disaster that had overtaken them and to look after their daughter. Then he wrote to Dr. Manette. He told the doctor that he did not consider him in any way responsible for his death. He finished writing these letters and then lay down to sleep. He woke early the next morning and began to walk around the cell restlessly. He had never seen the guillotine and he wondered what it looked like and exactly how he would be tied to it. The hours passed quickly. He heard nine o'clock strike and knew he would never hear it strike again. Then the clock struck ten and eleven, and twelve. Just after one o'clock, he heard footsteps outside in the corridor. The key was put in the lock and turned. Then he heard a voice whispering quickly in English. He's never seen me before. Go in alone. Be quick. The door opened and Sidney Carton came into the cell. He put his finger to his lips to show that he wanted Darnay to remain silent. Then he stepped forward and shook the prisoner's hand eagerly. Are you a prisoner too? Darnay asked him in dismay. No. I have influence with one of the jailers here, that's all. I've come from your wife. She has a request that she wants you to grant. What is it? You must do what she asks, Carton said urgently. There's no time to ask questions, no time for explanations. You must just do exactly what I tell you. Do you understand? Darnay nodded his head. Good. Now I want you to take off your boots and put on mine, Carton ordered. And hurry, we haven't got much time. Escape is impossible, Darnay said. 
You'd only die with me if we tried it. I'm not asking you to escape, Carton replied. If I do ask you to escape, you can refuse. But now take this cravat of mine and put it on. Give me yours. With great quickness, Carton exchanged clothes with the prisoner. Darnay protested all the while, but the lawyer would not listen to him. It's madness to try it, he kept saying. Don't throw away your life trying to save mine. I'm not asking you to escape, the lawyer repeated. If I do, you can always refuse. He looked around the cell and saw the paper and ink on the table. Go to the table and write exactly what I tell you, he commanded. Write exactly what I say, word for word. Darnay sat down at the table and picked up the pen. What shall I write? the prisoner asked. Carton began to dictate the letter. If you remember a conversation we had a long time ago, you will understand this when you see it. As he dictated, Carton's hand moved into his jacket pocket and he took out a handkerchief. Suddenly, he placed this handkerchief over Dane's mouth and held it there tightly. The prisoner struggled for a few seconds, and then his head fell forward onto the table. He was asleep. Carton went to the door of the cell and called softly. Come here. John Barsard entered the cell. He was very nervous and frightened. You see? Carton said pointing to the unconscious Charles Darnay. Your danger is not so very great. And will you keep your word? Barsard asked. Are you really determined to die for him, Mr Carton? I'll keep my word, the lawyer said firmly. No one will know that it's me who goes to the guillotine and not Darnay. Now go and call for help, he ordered. Tell the jailer that Darnay's visitor was overcome with grief when he saw his old friend and has fainted. Get the jailer to help you carry him outside. Take him to Mr. Lorry's house and put him in the carriage that's waiting there. A few minutes later, Carton was alone in the cell. There was quietness around him, and then he heard footsteps outside. Cell doors were thrown open, and harsh commands could be heard. Allez, allez! Get ici! It was time. The jailer turned the key in the lock and gave the summons. Every monde, follow me. The prisoner left the cell and followed the jailer into a large room. All the prisoners due to die that afternoon were gathered there. He stood in a dark corner by himself, worried that someone who knew the real Charles Darnay would see that he was an imposter. He had been standing there for a few moments when a young girl came up to him. She peered at him in the darkness. It is me, Citizen Evremond, she said. I am the seamstress you met in the other prison. He bowed his head in greeting. May I ride with you, Citizen Evremond? the girl asked humbly. It would give me courage to hold your hand. She raised her eyes to look into his face. Suddenly, she gave a gasp and stepped back in confusion. <gasps> Her eyes were wide open and she turned white. Carton put his finger to his lips. Are you dying for him? she asked. And his wife and child, the lawyer said. The seamstress gazed at him, lost in admiration. Let me stand by you and hold your hand, she begged. Carton put out his hand. To the end, he promised firmly. While the prisoners waited for the tumbrils that would carry them to death, a carriage left Mr. Lorry's house. The carriage drove to the gates of the city. Papers! a voice cried. The papers were handed over and the guard read them. Dr. Manette, which one is he? Mr. Lorry pointed to the old man. And his daughter Lucy. Where is she? Mr. Lorry pointed again. Is this the child, Lucy? Mr. Lorry nodded. Sidney Carton. Which one is he? 
Mr. Lorry pointed at a figure lying in the corner of the carriage. Forward. Chapter 12. A Flash and a Crash Madame Defarge was talking to her woman friend, Vengeance, and to Jacques III. Defarge is a good Republican and a brave man, Madame Defarge said. But he has certain weaknesses. He feels sorry for Dr Manette. That's a shame, Jack III said solemnly. A good citizen should not feel sorry. Madame Defarge raised her hand for silence. Jacques III was instantly quiet. I don't mind about the doctor, Madame Defarge said. He can go free for all that I care. But Evremond's family is a different matter. The wife and child must die. The wife is beautiful. Jacques III commented. She would look good on the guillotine. He rubbed his hands together eagerly. It'd be a pretty sight. I'm afraid my husband may warn them, Madame Defarge said ominously. I'm going to visit the wife now. She will be sad at Evremond's death and may say something against the Republic. That will give us the chance we need. What a woman you are! Vengeance cried in admiration. Indeed. Jacques III agreed with her. And a real friend to the Republic. Take my knitting, Madame Defarge told Vengeance. Keep my usual seat for me. I'll join you before the executions begin. You won't be late, Vengeance asked anxiously. You'll be there before the tumbrils arrive, won't you? Before they arrive, she repeated excitedly. Madame Defarge nodded, and then she walked away from her two friends. She carried a pistol and a knife hidden in her clothes, and her heart was fixed on hatred and revenge. Mr. Lorry had made his plans carefully the night before. He had decided that Miss Pross and Jerry should leave Paris at three o'clock in a small carriage. They would join the coach with the other passengers as soon as they could on the road outside Paris. As Madame Defarge was making her way through the streets to the house, Jerry and Miss Pross were making plans of their own. They had seen Charles Darnay being put into the coach, and they had seen the coach drive away. I'm so worried about them, Miss Pross said tearfully. They must get away safely, Mr Cruncher. But if the people see a second carriage leaving the house, they may get suspicious. That's what worries me, Mr Cruncher. I think you should go out and stop the vehicle and horses from coming here. Take them to the cathedral, she suggested. Wait for me there. That would be best, wouldn't it, Mr Cruncher? Perhaps you're right, ma'am, Jerry agreed. Uh, but I'd rather not leave you here alone, he added doubtfully. Don't worry about me, Miss Pross told him quickly. Wait for me at the cathedral at three o'clock, Mr Cruncher. Jerry left the house at twenty past two, and Miss Pross went inside to get ready for the journey. She was very nervous and kept looking around to make sure that no one had come into the house. As she walked from one room to another, she became aware that there was someone else in the house. She looked around in panic and saw Madame Defarge standing next to her. Madame Defarge looked coldly at the Englishwoman. Where is Evremond's wife? she demanded. Miss Pross thought quickly. All the doors were open. If Madame Defarge looked into the rooms, she would immediately see that the family had gone. There were four doors in the room. Miss Pross closed them all. Then she stood with her back to the door that had been Lucy's bedroom. Madame Defarge watched Miss Pross suspiciously. The two women stared at each other with instinctive distrust. You might be the wife of Lucifer, Miss Pross commented. 
But I am an Englishwoman. You won't get past me. Madame Defarge knew that Miss Pross was devoted to the family. For her part, Miss Pross knew that Madame Defarge was the family's enemy. I'm on my way to the executions, Madame Defarge said. I have come to say hello to Evremond's wife. Where is she? I know you're an evil woman, Miss Pross replied. But I'll fight you to the end. Each woman spoke her own language, and neither of them understood a word of what the other said. They looked at each other with defiance and hatred, and they did not need words to understand that a terrible battle was going on between them. Everyone's wife should not hide herself away from me, Madame Defarge said. It could be dangerous for her to hide. People might think she was an enemy of the Republic. Where is she? I'll never give in to you, Miss Pross replied. I'll fight you to the end, you wicked woman. Madame Defarge understood from the tone of Miss Pross's voice that she was in the presence of an enemy. Fool! She cried out in anger. You don't matter to me. It's Evremond's wife I want. Take me to her immediately. Or get out of my way. Madame Defarge took a step forward towards the door of Lucy's room. Miss Pross braced herself for the struggle. The two women continued to stare at each other. Doctor Manette, Evremond's wife. Where are you? There was no reply to Madame Defarge's sudden call. She continued to look at Miss Pross, and then Madame Defarge understood that they had gone. She ran quickly around the room and opened three of the four doors. She could see that possessions had been removed from the rooms. She turned angrily to Miss Pross. There is no one in that room behind you, she said accusingly. Let me look. Never, Miss Pross announced firmly. She understood exactly what Madame Defarge wanted. If they're not there in that room, I can have them brought back to Paris, Madame Defarge said to herself. As long as you don't know whether they're in that room or not, you don't know what to do, Miss Pross said to herself. And I'll never let you leave this house. Get away from the door. Madame Defarge said threateningly. She moved suddenly towards Miss Pross. Miss Pross took hold of the Frenchwoman around the waist and held on to her tightly. Madame Defarge struggled wildly and scratched Miss Pross's face cruelly with her nails. Miss Pross continued holding her. Madame Defarge felt inside her clothing for her pistol. She drew the weapon out and prepared to fire at Miss Pross. The Englishwoman saw the pistol and knocked it out of her enemy's hand. Miss Pross saw a flash of light, and she heard a crash. Then she found herself standing alone in the room. Madame Defarge was lying at her feet. She looked down. Madame Defarge was dead. Miss Pross looked at the body of her enemy for a few minutes. And then she turned her mind to what she needed to do next. She put on a bonnet and veil that covered the terrible scratches on her face, and walked out of the house. She walked quickly to the cathedral and waited for Jerry to come with a carriage. She had not been waiting for more than five minutes when he arrived. She climbed into the carriage hurriedly, and they drove away. Is there any noise in the streets? Miss Pross asked anxiously. Just the usual noises, Jerry told her. I can't hear you, Miss Pross said. What did you say? Jerry looked at her in surprise. He noticed the marks on her face, and he saw her clothing was torn and disordered. Is there any noise in the streets now? She asked again. Jerry nodded at her. He could hear the tumbrils rolling heavily through the streets. Carrying the prisoners to the guillotine. There's the roll of those dreadful carts, he told her. 
Can you hear that, miss? I can't hear anything, she said softly. There was a, a flash and a crash. After that, there was a great stillness. And I don't think I'll ever hear anything again as long as I live. If she can't hear the roll of those dreadful carts, she never will hear anything else in this world, Jerry thought. And indeed, she never did. Chapter 13 The Guillotine The tumbrils rolled noisily through the Paris streets. There were six of them that day, each containing the unhappy prisoners who were going to die for the Republic. Some of the prisoners looked out at the city with interest as they were carried through the streets. Others were too miserable to look up. One man had been driven mad by his sufferings and he began to sing and dance. The crowd pushed close against the tumbrils and many people asked the guard which prisoner was the famous Evremond. The guard pointed to a man who was standing up at the back of one of the vehicles. The man was listening to a young girl who was telling him something with great intensity. The spy was waiting when the tumbrils reached the end of their journey to the guillotine. He looked anxiously to see that the prisoner was still there. He had been afraid that the bargain would be broken. A man standing next to him asked which prisoner was Evremond. There, at the back. The spy replied. Down with Evremond! The man cried loudly. Hush, hush! The spy said in a frightened voice. The man looked at him in surprise. He'll be dead in five minutes. Barsad explained quietly. Let him die in peace. The man sneered contemptuously and went on shouting. Death to Evremond! Death to Evremond! The prisoner looked for a moment into the face of the man who was shouting, and then he recognised the spy. He stared closely at the spy's face. The tumbrils drew up to the guillotine. The place of execution contained a number of chairs, and the people of Paris were sitting there, waiting for the prisoners. Madame Defarge's friend, Vengeance, was sitting in the front row, and she had put her friend's knitting on an empty chair by her side. Where is she? Vengeance wondered. If she doesn't come soon, she'll miss it all. The first prisoner was led to the guillotine. He lay down on the awful machine. There was a crash. The executioner held up a bloody head for the crowd to see. The women stopped their knitting for a moment and counted. One. At last it was the turn of those in the third tumbril. The prisoner called Evremond stepped down to the ground and turned to help the seamstress down. He made her stand with her back to the guillotine. She looked into his face. You have helped me to be strong, she told him. Keep your eyes on me, Sidney Carton replied. Don't look at anything else. Is it time? she asked. Is it time now? Yes. She kissed him and moved away towards the guillotine. In a moment her life was over. Sidney Carton spent his last few moments thinking of the people he was leaving behind. They will be happy, he told himself. She will have another child, and she will give that child my name. The child will grow into a fine man, and will follow the same path that I did. I see him making my name famous as he achieves success. His successes will wipe away the stains of my name. I can see him when he is older, bringing his own son here to Paris. I see them looking at this spot, and the father telling his child my story with a tender voice.